Yeah, uh, thanks for, uh, for for joining. I don't know how many people um, taking part, so probably like 10, I don't know. Anyway, so um, it's a good opportunity to talk with you guys about these uh, scaring coronavirus. So I prepared slides, basically that's what I read since probably since the end of the January toward now. So unfortunately, some of them, so I, I prepared this, these slides a few days ago. So what you can see, things change uh, drastically from day to day, right? So like so we start with this one. So they just show you how things happen, how things change. But probably already everybody knows so for, the, for the United States, so the, the infected number is already doubled since uh, this, is, this is like uh, four days ago. So not, no, five days ago. So now it's already double, right? So here I just give you a sense how things evolved and how things um, change over time and made different from one country to the other country. So this benchmark is here, it's like China, right? So Italy and Spain and the United States. So this overall incidence or overall infected, this reported or confirmed in um, uh, cases. Now, what is this? This is uh, this, um, uh, a f um, fatality. So people, died from this uh, coronavirus. And uh, you're going to see similar trend, right? So in this one, what you can see, so this is for some selected regions, like so for example, Madrid, like here. And so this one, this is the worst hit part in Italy, right? This is epicenter. That's actually, that's where my wife's family is coming from. So I've been living in that city for more than 10 years. So I pretty, uh, pretty know, I, I pretty much know what happened there because I've uh, all of my friend and my yeah I think so most of my friends in China so live in that region so I kind of know what happened there and here so this is Washington State that's where we have the first um, 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 epidemics happens in the United States right so that just give you an idea what happens right? okay and so to understand oh by the way so today I guess so the title of these um these events called uh, uh will this becomes a what do you call the great depression or maybe it becomes an economic crisis or not right so that's that's the questions so i guess to answer that question it's not easy question to answer right so um to answer that question so i think we need to understand what happened and so how that compared to history so i'm going to spend a lot of time to explain to you or compare the current crisis with what happened in history and then so i'm going to explain to you so how that affect the economy because first of all this is a health crisis this is not economic crisis but then we need to understand so how come did become the economic crisis so that's the second sense and the third so i'm going to explain to you so what the government has done or should they have done what they have done all right so the third thing is and then, and then so the last thing I'm going to briefly talk about, so what is my view? So what's going to happen next? So whether this is going to be an economic crisis or not? So basically there are four parts, right? So, so we are in the first one. So I just show you three graphs. So you have a sense what happened, right? So now I'll just give you a brief sense. So how bad it is or why this one becomes a pandemic, right? It seems like it looks like a flu. That actually, that's what President Trump said, right? So whether you like or not. So he said this is like a flu, right? So now let's see whether this is a flu or not, all right? So this one is compared to SARS. It happened in 2003. Actually, at that time, I was in China, right? So I actually, I was in Wuhan. All right, so look at it here. So uh, the SARS, it died out in less than half a year. And in, in the worst of day, it infected less than, uh, I think around 8,000 people worldwide. And the fatality is around 800. So basically 10% of fatality rate, right? And this is the current one. But again, so as people know, so this number has been shoot up. So this is very, very early stage. Uh, before I uh, before we dial in Zoom, so I believe the number is approaching 1 million. So, I, so my projections or my sense is, so uh, it's going to reach 1 million in this week. So that's what, that's what happens. So you can see, this outbreak or this pandemic spread extremely fast, right? So it's compared to SARS. Right, and here, so this is a very useful, interesting um, figure I saw a long time ago. So yeah, so today's, oh, by the way, so right now, so we say a long time, actually it's not that long, so probably a few weeks, because right now things happen so drastically. So a few weeks can be a long time, right? So that's what they estimate. Um, that's, I believe this from CDC or somewhere. Um, 
they have a huge region, right? So in some sense, this is not quite informative, but it should give you a sense. What is this? On the horizontal line, we've seen the, what do we, what they call the, um, the uh, contagions, right? So the further toward the right-hand side, you spread faster. And the vertical line is the fatality rate. So basically, 100% uh, that is the worst case, right? And then, so this red region, red, red box is what they estimate the current um, pandemic will look like. So we don't know. So the, apparently this is like a big, big, uh, big box. So it's probably going to be in the middle. But overall, so what we're going to see, this is more contagious than flu. And this is more deadly than flu, right? So probably it's less deadly than SARS, but, it's, but it seems like in terms of um, um, contagiousness, so it's, uh, it's moved toward the right-hand side, it's very contagious compared to SARS, right? All right, and okay, so to understand, so by the way, so like here, so it just seems like SARS is worse, right? So because way more contagious, sorry, way more deadly, and it probably is similar, so the current one is probably similar uh, contagious as SARS, but uh, why it created a pandemic? So we need to understand what happened since 2003. So in 2003, so this is in 2003, this is 2019. So this is just, we look at China alone, right? So in China, so you can see during the past close to two decades, because of economic boom, because of economic growth. So the tram passenger quadrupled and air passenger, I don't know, this is probably like eight times increase, right? What that means is even though we have the same disease, so you're gonna see this is gonna spread way more faster because of the um, uh, this uh, fast train and because of the um, com uh, the transportation, right? All right. Okay. So now let's just switch the things a little bit, right? So to understand, so how we are going to cope with this and why we have such high uh, fertility and plot and particularly so the fertility rate is, uh, varies from one country to the other country. So what we have here, so this is essentially, so the uh, critical care bed per 100,000 people, the more, the better, right? So from here, so this is for European country and the European average is around 10. And you can see there are several countries really are not doing well. Like, oh yeah, Italy so was okay, but so compared to Germany, it's very low, it's less than half. So in that sense, it can possibly explain so why in Germany, so the fatality rate is so low so far. Right, so this this is in uh, Europe. Now we move a little further. So now to give you a big picture, this is what because we are in the United States. That's that's I guess that's where we uh, what where, what are we are interested in. So uh, to be honest with you, I was surprised. So I was surprised so in US. So so we have um, we have so many beds. Oh, I was anyway. So probably it's my my ignorance. So it's way better than Germany. Is 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 better than any other country, right? So I guess this, uh, this is only my guess that also my partially explains so why the government wasn't uh, response uh, swiftly enough because because they have the facility. So that's just part of the reason, it's perhaps not the main reason. Anyway, you can see, so this interaction compares the United States in the, in the very top, right? so you have way more uh, facility compared to any other country in the world, right? So even you have more than, if you, if you have, if even you have more than uh, more bit in the compared to Germany. Now, if we look at, oh, so let me skip this one. So now if we look at uh, the uh, inside United States, so now the picture is slightly different, right? Because let me go back to here. So United States, this is 100,000 and 34.7, right? So now go to here. So what we see here. So this is translated 100, right? So because this is 10,000, you have 100,000. So this color means you have 100. And the average is here. So, and then, so where we are in this color. So basically, so we are here, right? So we are slightly, probably slightly better than the average, no? And then we have other region, I don't, I don't quite understand. So why those region uh, have higher um, ICU capacity? I was expecting like in um, coast area, maybe so, maybe we need to zoom in. But anyway, from this, from this map, we can see there's a wide uh, variety or wide difference in terms of the capacity we have. Okay, so, so, okay, so from here, so you can see, so this can potentially create a public health issue once we have a surge of patients. 
who need hospitalized, right? Okay. All right, so again, so skip this one. Now, right, so here's what I want to um, mention an interesting thing that's closely related to my current research, right? So what is this? This is just for the US, state, US data. And then the, the economists find out, so in US, we have a very interesting housing inequality and income inequality. What do we see here? So the higher income, higher income you, you have, and then, then the longer expectancy. And this number can be very significant, and the difference can be very significant. So if you basically, so if we are here compared to someone here, so you're going to outlive by 15 years. Right? So that's a drastic difference. And why I put this figure here, and why I think this is important, this is because for now I think, so this pandemic is going to hit, I mean, eventually, for now, it probably is not the case. Okay, let me elaborate a little bit. So eventually, so this pandemic is going to affect the lower income people more, given you are in the same society. But at the very beginning, it may not be the case. Think about in the United States or think about Omaha, right? So the first case, first reported case is a lady who traveled to United Kingdom, right? And that, what that means, at the very beginning, so who is going to more um, likely to get, to get to cut the virus? Who can, who, um, who can pay for the travel who, or who are more likely to travel? So meaning who are probably uh, slightly higher income, right? But eventually, so um, the lower, income or uh, people who do not have health insurance again so that's that's probably that's uh, that's a particular thing about uh, united states so because the lower income people may not uh, are less likely to have health insurance if they do not have health insurance at, at least at the early stage of this uh, spread so they may worry about to uh, to to um, to sorry they might worry about uh, to pay for the high cost of the medical check or the medical bill they are going to have or at the same time, they was worried about, so they may lose a job if they uh, they will <coughs> excuse me they will test positive, right? So in other sense, so this pandemic eventually is going to uh, exacerbate the income inequality in a particular society, probably even worse in the United States. So that's why I put this here, right? Uh, yeah. So another interesting thing followed earlier picture. You can see so this income inequality, health inequality, is kind of uh, uh, is kind of different depending on where you live. And I found out this particular interesting because right now so the, uh, the hotbed is in New York City, right? So New York City, so they have, we have the highest number of incidents and we have highest fatality rate. But what this picture shows is if you live in uh, New York City, if you are a low income person, you are way better than someone who lives in Detroit, right? So basically, so if I'm the poorest person in New York City, and my life expectancy is, is more than five years compared to someone who lives in uh, Detroit. And uh, what's the explanation here and uh, what's the implication to the discussion we have today? So one of the possible explanation here is uh, in New York City, there's a spillover effect from um, higher income, higher educated um, people who have a healthier life. So that's gonna be a uh, impact on how you lead your healthy life. So that partially explains why the life expectancy here, here is higher. But unfortunately, uh, in, in this pandemic, in this uh, discrepancy or this advantage doesn't play out anymore because because this is like an emergency, this is a crisis, right? Whether, yes, I mean, it's in the larger scale, so if you have a healthier lifestyle, so meaning so you have a lower uh, underlying health condition and meaning so you may have um, a lower chance to need hospitalization, so that may help you. But in a short period of time, so whether you are in New York City or in Detroit, so overall, once we got the same, once we have the same uh, infection rate, so I guess the fatality rate is going to be same, right? Now let's briefly explain to to this um, um, famous model in the public health, and then I'm going to lead to the third topic. So what we can do as uh, as economists, or what the government can do to help this uh, pandemic, right? So what is this? This is a famous, uh, I, uh, I think it's the SIR model. What is S? S uh, stands for susceptible, right? Meaning so any time period, any year, uh, any moment of time, so we have a virus basically jump from animal to human being. And then so a certain fraction of the population suddenly becomes susceptible. I would say probably in most cases, 100% uh, of the population, they are possibly uh, can be caught by the virus. 
And then, so this is the population. And then, so with a certain probability, so you becomes infected. And so what that plays out, so there's a, uh, there's a uh, parameter beta. And this I is number of people who infected. And S is, uh, is a population who are susceptible, right? So meaning, so they basically, this means, okay, so we have more uh, people infected. And then so people moving around and then so you're more likely to get infected. Once you're infected and then so you uh, become to recover with certain probability, once you recover, you're good. Or another possibility is in this model, so maybe you, you, you die, right? So, but then so you're out of the picture. So this famous SIR, SIR model is becomes uh, the, the benchmark for public health. And recently there are a few economists start to introduce this famous um, the model in uh, an economic, uh, economic theory to understand so what the government can do, what the trade off government is going to face. But from here, it's very clear, right? So, how we can reduce the damage. So, we must what? Well, we must reduce this number, right? So, we want to uh, uh, least the number of people get infected as possible as, as we can. And then, so that's going to reduce the number of fatalities as much as we can. But that's from the standpoint of view of public health, right? So if you ask a public health uh, expert, so they're going to tell you, so my job is just we save as much life as we can. But then, so what is economics? The economics is, so if you want to save life, and then so you can, what, you can reduce this number. You can reduce the probability of people who are caught by the virus, and then eventually reduce the probability of people died from this virus. Now, how you can do that? Right now, so we have a term called, let me just go to the next one, it's called the flatten curve, right? So this is without intervention. Without intervention, so you have a sudden spike, let's go back to the previous one, meaning so you have lots of people jump from here to here suddenly. And then so what we can do, so we must slow this jump. And why we are slow this jump? If without this jump, and then so we are going to crash the uh, um, healthcare system. Remember, even US, so we have the best facility, we still only have uh, less than 40 critical bed for one every 100,000 uh, people. Meaning, so in, the, in Omaha, we only have 500 bed um, available to us. So, we, meaning, so if suddenly, so everybody get infected, and then, so even with the uh, most um, op optimistic estimation, so we probably like 1,000 people with uh, need hospital bed, what, we, what you can do? So basically, you have nothing you can do, right? So even your public health uh, expert, you cannot do. And then, so they are, they are uh, urging us to try to flatten the curve. But then, so this doesn't come for free. So how you can flatten the curve? So basically, they are asking you, basically, pretty much everywhere. The government urge everyone to stay at home. But if you urge people to stay at home, that's come to a huge social cost. What are the costs? There are two costs. Number one, the business, they, have, they are also shorter, right? And then the second, the worker, they have to uh, stay at home. So meaning, so there are two impacts on the economy. Number one, there's no demand, right? So you're not going to dine out, you're not going to the, uh, to the um, um, uh, shopping mall, you're not going to watch the uh, movie, you're not going to buy a car right now. Meaning so the demand is going to um, uh, going down dra dramatically. At the same time, so that's going to lead a lot of uh, unemployment, right? So as, let, me show, let me see, okay, let me show you the uh, picture. Right, so this is, economic, this is one of the economic costs we have paid. What is that? So this is from 2000 to 2020 right now, right? So you can see most of the time, even in the worst days, so this is uh, the, uh, the most recent financial crisis. And we know that's the worst recession we had after Great Depression. So even in the worst day, the uh, jobless claim is less than 700,000, what we had last week. This is what we've seen last week. So the jobless claim shoot to over three million. Okay, so this is have a bigger pic. There's this is a bigger, a bit of rich in the picture. So this is the beginning of 2020. This is a last week. You can see most of the time because actually we are in the longest expansion in his in history. It's more than 10 years. So in most of the times, the jobless claim is around 200,000. Suddenly, this jumps to over three million. So that's the cost. And I want to emphasize this probably is the lower, lower bound of our estimation. Why is it lower bound? So it's because people suddenly lost their job. There are lots of people that do not have a chance to claim jobless. And at the same time, so you have so many jobless claims. So basically crash the system of the government, right? So this is a lower bound. And this is one of the causes we have paid. Now, what we can do? What we can do? All right. So this is another picture to show you. So this is the financial crisis. 
this is a current crisis. You can, see, you can see this shoot up drastically. And most economists predict so this number is going to stay for at least a few weeks. Right? So you can see the difference. Now, right, so I'm skip this. Right, okay, so here, so this is another way to look at the economic damage, right? So what, is, what do we have here? This is real GDP, and we were here, so we have been a long expansion, right? So we, so this was, this was, a, this is a financial crisis. So the GDP dropped close to 10%, and there was a sharp rebound, and then we have a gradual um, expansion. This expansion was 10 years old, and now, so we have a decline. And again, so what caused this decline? What's the difference of the current crisis to this crisis? This crisis is because we have some problem in the financial sector and this financial sector spread out to the real economy. What do we have here? So right now, so we have a rivers, we have a public health crisis. And then this public health crisis, one way we contain that crisis is we have to ask people to stay at home. And then suddenly you have a public health crisis that spread to the real economy and spread to the financial market, right? And this is estimation by most of economists. You have uh, the most optimistic uh, estimation, the economy is going to decline by 4% and then bouncing back. You have the most uh, pessimistic uh, estimation is going to drop by 10% and this is a uh, baseline. So personally, I would, uh, my, I would say probably it's close, close here, and I can elaborate a little bit more toward the end of uh, today's uh, discussion. Uh, but here, just give you a sense what is damage uh, we have to pay. But again, so this is because of the public health, um, public health crisis. And the only way so far, given the technology, the only way we can contain these crises is asking people to stay put, stay at home. So then, so that leads to unemployment and leads to um, and, uh, um, the decline in. Um, demand, so that's why we have a decline in GDP. All right, so now I'm going to explain to you what we can do uh, as, I mean, as economists, or maybe so what the, what the um, policy maker uh, can do. Okay, so let me skip this. This is essentially tell you what happened to the uh, SP 500. Uh, this, this declined quite a lot, but uh, personally, I was waiting for here anyway. Okay, so let me go here. All right, so the first response the government has done is called interest rate. Why they want to call the interest rate is because so we have a uh, public health crisis and this uh, spread to a real, real economy. And then so the firm and the investor, they was worried about the deep decline and then everybody was demanding for cash. If everyone demanding for cash and then we have a liquidity issue. And then to resolve the liquidity issue, what the Federal Reserve can, what the Federal Reserve Bank they can do is they are going to cut interest rate. But so they could cut interest, but in, in practice, essentially, they inject money to the, to the uh, market or they just provide unlimited amount of liquidity to resolve the potential um, stress in the financial market, right? So this is the first thing they have done. And from here, you can see, so they learn from the past, they, they uh, move very, very quick, right? So this is just less than two months. So this in the financial crisis, it take them um, a year to, to, to do the best, right? So that's, what they, that's how they learn from the past. So one thing they have done. The other thing they have done, so I'm going to spend a little bit more time on this. So they, uh, this is a physical measure and this is called CARE Act. CARE stands for Corona Relief Act and Economic Recovery. Right, so that stands for CARES, right? So they have these CARES. Essentially, uh, so the total bill is more than two, Two trillion is more than ten percent of the total GDP. So how they are going to spend this money? So I characterized in three uh, three group. Number one, so around one third goes to public health. I think that's the, um, that's a priority. So we need the money to spend on the healthcare to to fight the coronavirus. And then so you have another one third, a little bit more, to business. And there are two type of business. Uh, the bill was targeted. Why is those business big business? And sometimes we, I mean, I guess most people don't like, so they say like a bailout. So bailout, who bailout this air, airline company? Say for example, uh, American Airlines, Delta, United. Right? So basically uh, over 90% of, of their airplane are grounded, right? So they, their, uh, their stock prices um, basically touch the, uh, like um, um, decline like a rock, right? And so uh, the government decided to build them out. Why they want to build them out? So for two reasons. Number one, so they are critical to the um, economy because you needed this transportation. 
And secondly, the airline company alone um, hires more than 750,000 workers. What happens if these, uh, airline, if, if, if this airline industry um, disappear because of this crisis, meaning you, you will uh, lose at least 750,000 jobs, right? So in that sense, so the government decided to build them out. But there's a lot of story goes on. So even among those um, people who work for, the, for them, so I'll urge the government do not build, build them out. So we can talk about that later. Uh, okay, so at the same time, so they have a huge amount of money lent to the small business. Why they want to lend to the small business? Because they want to keep this business to, uh, to stay afloat. And uh, also, very important things you want, to, you want to know is in the United States, over 50% of jobs are created by small business, meaning you hire less than 500 people, right? So that's, that's the engine of um, economic growth. So that's why the government spends so much money on that. So basically, just keep those, uh, um, just just give give those um, uh, business either small or big some oxygen. Just make sure they can survive. They can survive toward the end of the crisis. Now, the third big chunk of money goes to households, including you and including me. But there are two categories. One is I would call it like stimulus. What's stimulus? So the government decides to offer everyone some free money. We call the helicopter money, right? So this kind of exotic things. It did not happen until recently. Basically, so in the following few weeks, most of us are going to be expecting to receive a check from treasurer. Depending on your income, you are going to receive uh, a check of uh, $1,200 per uh, parents and $500 per uh, child, right? Why they want to do that is because, so now everyone stay at home. Right now, it's over three quarters of Americans now ask to stay at home. So the demand's declining. And then, so the government was hoping so if I give you a free check, so you may spend a fraction of them, so that's going to help lift, to lift the, uh, the demand. Okay, besides these um, the helicopter money, the government also offers uh, very generous unemployment insurance benefit. So on top of the existing uh, benefit, so every unemployed person can claim additional 600 per week up to six, uh, up to four months. Why they want to do that is because there are people who lost a job because that's because the government asks you to ask the businesses to, to shop, ask you to stay at home, right? So in that sense, so this is a safety net to so make sure people can survive and to see the tunnel at the end of the crisis. So that's what the government has done. All right, so here just give you a sense, not, not only United States doing that, pretty much every advanced economy is doing that. Right? So this is overall, you can see it's close to 8% of, of the GDP and the US is, um, it's more drastic, right? So they spend over 10% of their um, GDP to fight these coronavirus. Um, but it seems like there's another stimulus coming. So this, this is the third one. So we have more to come. To come. And you can see some goes to safety net, like safety them, they give you, um, uh, give you better uh, unemployment insurance benefit, or they give you a uh, loan to a small business. And they have fiscal stimulus, including helicopter, um, helicopter money, right? So that's what the government have done. All right, so it seems I run out of time. So let me just quickly wrap up what we have, uh, what is, what's the message? Okay, so I don't have time to discuss these. All right, so this is, uh, this is a data click. Uh, so this is compared to the past six different uh, crises. Okay, so let me quickly run through these. So what's the punchline? All right, so what we, okay, I'm gonna stop here, okay, so to summarize, so this is a crisis. This crisis is first around public health and then spread to the real economy, right? And then, so what we can do to contain the rivals so far, the best way is to ask people to stay at home. And if you ask people to stay at home, and then so you have to pay the huge economic cost. And then so in order to help the economy, what you can do, so you have to uh, offer some physical stimulus or offer some uh, uh, relief in the, um, in the uh, sorry, you, you need to offer some uh, liquidity support, right? So that's what you have to do. And then, so what's going to happen next? I want to mention two things. Number one, so we have, we have spent over 10% of the GDP and eventually who are going to pay the cost, it seems like so the taxpayer. So meaning, so eventually, so we are going to have a big burden on our shoulder for the next generation. But apparently right now, this is not a good timing to talk about that. Why is because right now, so the most important is safe, safe life and safe the economy. So I think a majority of the economy, economists believe so right now, so there's no, uh, there's no time or no point to discuss how we are going to take care of those debt, right? But eventually this is going to be a huge issue it's coming up uh, in 10 or 20 years. This one thing is on one street. 
The second is, so uh, I'm going to uh, um, end the discussion regarding to my projection or what's my view about the severeness of this economic crisis. I would say largely depending on how we are going to dealing with this crisis and also largely depend, depending on how the country and its, uh, and its uh, different country, how they are going to cooperate. If we cannot contain the rivals in the fairly short term, even say we can have two or three uh, months, and then so this temporary unemployment can become a structural unemployment, and then that's going to um, hinder the uh, economic innovation, that's going to lead to a severe recession. If they, on the other hand, so if after this crisis, most of the countries think globalization is bad and they believe it's better protect themselves not cooperate with each other and then so we are going to see a huge damage to global supply chain again so that's going to create a huge damage to innovation to cooperation to global economic growth and then so we are going to have a very very severe recession down the road and probably it's going to for it's going to last for a while not just for like one or two years so that's that's my personal opinion all right uh, thank you so much for your attention question Shigang, just first, thank you for um, uh, spending this time to do this. Uh, um, I wanted to remind the students who are in the the uh, in the Zoom meeting a couple things. Um, the first one is is that your microphone phone is on mute, so if you ask a question of Dr. Fang, you need to unmute yourself. And the second thing is is that this um, you know fair warning or, or whatever uh, this uh, Zoom meeting is being recorded, so this whole thing is being recorded. All right, so we need to be careful regarding our political view. Is that is that is that what you're suggesting? That's what I was worried about. Uh, no, my um, I, I'm not suggesting that at all. I'm purely suggesting that the university has a policy that we need to warn people about the videos being recorded. That's all. <laughs> okay. Okay. No question. So I have a question. So after this is Dalton. I'm a uh, economics major. Yes. So I have a question about. Um, the long-standing effects as compared to the crash in 08. Uh, so after that crash happened, we had this um, amazing rally after the fact that eventually got erased by this crisis. Um, are we, how long do you think it will be until we start the recovery? Do we think it's gonna be uh, a longer time or is it totally come down to the containment of the virus? It's, it's totally depending on how fast we can contain the virus. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. But but it's but in some sense, how fast we can contain the virus is largely like indigenous meaning. So depending on how the government manage and how people respond. That's my that's my sense. Thank you. Um, I guess I had a question. Since you um, have like family in China, do you think that they reported all of the correct like um, sick people and like deaths, or <laughs> do you think there's more than what they're saying? So that's a good question. So personally, I was uh, I was asking myself many times, asking my friends many times. So. But here's my answer to you. So this number may not be accurate, but even though so you, you inflate the number by 10, 10 times, it's probably still better than Italy, still better than so what we are going to experience in here. Okay, thank you. But so, but I probably wasn't clear, so why I mentioned like 10 times, just saying, okay, because in general, people were thinking, it's that's my this this is my a prior right so this is how I see I see the issue so generally people think okay Ch Chinese government so they uh, probably they they do they cannot handle the things um, effectively or they they are less efficient in terms of handling these things but now so the ironic things is uh, even though you inflate the number by ten times it seems like it's still doing better than Italy. But however, I'm not suggesting, so Chinese government, they are doing a superb uh, job 
what I'm trying to say is, so uh, like the link, uh, like just circle back to my earlier sins, because this is like only a short talk. So, and also I need to be careful about my particular view. So what I'm trying to say is, so we probably want or need to learn a little bit from what they have done, right? And uh, secondly, so for, for looking, so we probably need cooperation, either in terms of um, content these rivals or in terms of future economic growth. So basically what I'm trying to say is, so we need to be careful. We may throw out the baby with water. So that's literally what I wrote to a like open letter to many economists recently. Like two weeks ago, I wrote an open letter to um, economists in the Western world. So basically, I just express my concern. Like here, we in the Western world, so we throw the baby out of water, meaning so we did not listen or did not pay attention. What was the lesson they have learned from this terrible tragedy? I'm not sure whether I'm clear or not. No, I that's good. I just it just seems like, like their rates were so much lower than anywhere else, and I'm not sure how that's really possible, especially with. Oh, well, okay. So let me. So I think so. Okay. So I think I wasn't clear anyway. So let me just answer your question directly. So what I was trying to explain is so maybe a little bit. Um, it's like the big detour. So from what I gather, so I think, so if you inflate the number by 150%, that probably is, that's the accurate estimation. And then, so why they, they can do that is because they have very draconian um, quarantine measure. So there are two things. They explain what, why they can do what they have done. Number one, they have quarantine. So this quarantine is not what we see. So the, the government order you to stay at home. It's like legally, so you are binding to stay at home. Right? So this is number one. And then number two, like there's a Wall Journal article recently uh, have an a interesting piece. They said, so they say, like basically they say, okay, it's Western country um, only hear part of the story. So quarantine is not enough. What else they did, so saving them, so you have someone who infected in the family, right? So you quarantine uh, one person, like asking or he, ask him or her to stay at home is not enough. So basically you need to put them in a separate facility to prevent further spread. L what they call like a ma uh, makeshift uh, hospital. So they have a temporary place for people who uh, may potentially infect it. So does that make sense or not? Yeah, yeah. Why don't we have that here? <laughs> Why don't we have that here? So because we have very different legal system. This is like the democratic country. It's very difficult to implement that. And, uh, and apparently that goes beyond the discussion for economic. This is more like a political. Right, so that's my answer to you. Okay, thank you. Okay. So I, I also have a question uh, specifically for you and your opinion. So um, I, I'm currently living in, uh, the, in like central Nebraska because I, I moved to back back home. And um, there is this, this um, essential uh, business here in, in central Nebraska. Uh, it is a factory, a meat packing factory. And there are over 5,000 workers in this meat packing factory. And because they're essential, um, they cannot close down because of the coronavirus because then they can make the economy worse. Um, so there are over 5,000 uh, workers in this factory. So there's a large agglomeration of people in a small place. And um, there has already been a confirmed coronavirus case last night um, in the factory and a worker in the factory. They tested a bunch of people, but they're still choosing not to close down. Uh, they're doing this to uh, stop uh, the economy from crashing very quickly. But uh, could it be possible that this may actually hurt it even more if a lot more people are going to get sick? Because most, this is like the, this, this business is the business that pretty much hires most of the low income people in this town, well, 46,000 people. So like their kids who can get sick, their grandparents can get sick, their parents can get sick uh, because of the fact that this business with 5,000 people um, are so agglomerated and they already have coronavirus within them and are still choosing not to close down in order to prevent um, 
of the crashing of the economy, essentially. All right, so this is a really excellent question. So, so I'm going to have like a long answer because this is just really a difficult question. So I'm going to uh, say two things. One is, let's start with the easier one. So let's go back to this chart. So you guys can see this, right? Can you see this picture? Yep, I can see it. Yep. All right, so just go back here. So the one way to answer that is, so the government decided to spend a lot of money to, to help those workers, basically. And then to so give you a slightly version, maybe it's easier for you to understand, like in Germany, I believe in Germany. So what it did is, if the business uh, decided to keep the worker, and even though the worker cannot work because of sick or because out of um, uh, concern of um, infection, the government is going to pay up to 80% of the worker's salary. And then, so that's kind of uh, uns partially answer your question. So, because most of the worker in the town you mentioned, they are low paid, low hour workers, right? So in that sense, so the government, what the government can do, and actually the government is doing this, offer them some safety net support. Does that make sense? Yes, that, that, that makes sense because they're getting the, they're getting some financial aid from the government. Right, so the government is doing something, right? So. Now, so the other aspect of this question is, so I need to say, I mean, the question you have asked is really a big question. And then, so depending on who you ask, and then, so who you ask, so there are three possible persons you're going to ask. One is public health person. And then one is the economist under myself, and the third is a politician, right? And then, so if you ask a public health person what he's, he or she is going to say, most likely you say, okay, so you need to shut this down. You need to keep the worker on um, quarantine. And because their objective is what? to minimize the life loss, right? So this is a public health, what the, what, what the public health expert is gonna tell you. And then what, uh, what is gonna, economy is gonna tell you, so what economics, the fundamental economics is we must face trade-off. What is the trade-off here? So if we keep our business open, so the people is gonna infect it, people is gonna die. And now if we keep the uh, business shut, like in, in, in your particular, particular case, if we, if we shut, shut down that, um, that factory or that, that business, what's going to happen? Two things. Number one, people are going to lose their job, right? And secondly, so we are going to have shortage of meat or whatever, right? And then, so as an economist, we always think about a trade-off and then what we can do. So we are going to, like, like this chart partially answer your question or your concern. So we are going to let as many people as possible to stay at home. And then so we compensate them with some paycheck. Right? And then so we are gonna keep those essential business open, right? But however, so you, you just offer me a very difficult problem to solve, right? So because it seems like, so their business is very essential and then so you have people who are potentially affected. What are we gonna do? And that's probably need to ask a politician what the politician is gonna do. So the, sorry, so let me finish that. So the, the economy is going to weigh the trade-off, right? So you, I hope you understand, so the trade-off I just mentioned. And then, so the position, what the position is gonna do, so the position is going to make a decision, to make a call. And what else they can do? So what else they can do? And then, so they make it use their uh, administrative power or whatever the power, they can do some transfer or they can do some allocation. And the civic level, so, in, in U.S., probably it's difficult or not necessary. Okay, so like even in U.S., so President Trump, so he can use his power. I forgot the exact name. So he can order or ask some firm to do certain things, right? So he ordered GM to pro to produce ventilator. Is that correct? Uh, yeah. So 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 essentially, they they, they are deciding. Um, that some people get like can go home if they're like really sick or like they're older, but um, they're they're just staying open mostly because they're essential. But they are given the option of going home. Uh, right. They aren't they aren't specifically paying people, but the, the they they are saying that um, if 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 you know if you have to leave, the government will probably step in. 
Um, but they are helping people who are over the age of like 60 and are more likely to die. They, they are helping those people. They are giving. No, no, no. Yeah, I agree. So that's, that's what we just explained. This is what this CARES Act uh, doing, right? Exactly. Yeah. So then so I'm talking about another thing. I'm just saying, so in, in the particular case you mentioned, now we are seeing it's getting worse. Why we worse? Because you have this essential business. It must keep open for the entire society, right? Because yeah. people need food, right? Exactly. And then, so if you only cares about those individuals and then you allow them to leave and then you allow the business so closed, but for the well-being of the society, we must, we must keep them open. So that's a tough call, right? And then, so what I'm trying to say is now, so you can have some political, um, I don't know what we call it. So anyway, so you can have some um, additional measures. Say, for example, this happens in some part of the world, like say in China. So what they can do is so uh, they are going to import or other workers from different places to operate the factory. So, so what you're essentially trying to say is that, um, um, in theory, uh, what, what they could be thinking is that if they if they decide to let's say close down the business, that could actually hurt more people. Um, it, right. it, you know, although they may save the people that are working, it may hurt other people um, that currently don't work there. For example, people who uh, want to buy meat because meat prices will go up and supply will decrease. Right. Or, right. or or other things such as like, well, now these 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 workers are earning less money, so they're spending less money on their businesses. So that's essentially what you're saying, which makes perfect sense. It's just, I guess, it's just more like I wanted to hear your opinion on it to kind of get more knowledge. But yes, that that is a really good response. You're right. right. Let me just give you. Let me just uh, just nail that question down so it's a little bit more 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 clear, right? So just pretend. So I have a meat business, and you are my uh, employees, right? And say, for example, so this is meat business is so important because we provide meat for the entire country, right? And then, but unfortunately, so you may got uh, you may caught by a virus, and then so you have to go home. And then, so what we can do as a government, first thing is we are going to give you a paycheck so that you can rest at home. So once you recover, you come back to work again, and you're not starving. But this is not enough, and so we do not have anyone to work for the meat factory. And then, so people somewhere else is going to start it because we have no uh, meat production. And then, what else the government can do? The our government can. There are two ways. One is they just order someone, say, them from Tennessee, come to here to operate the business. Who is healthy? Or what they can do is so they are going to offer higher way to hire someone who are healthy come to here to operate the business, so that they can they can maintain the production, so then they can solve the potential uh, food shortage. Right, so that's that's my opinion. That was perfect. Thank you. You answered my question completely. I yeah. appreciate it. Um, do you think it's realistic for us to be planning to go back to school in August if there's not a vaccine yet? Like on campus classes? So August, I think so we should be fine. That's my that's my estimation. August should be fine. If it's put this way, so if we cannot, if we cannot contain the virus by August, we are going to be in a very, very deep trouble. So this is beyond my imagination, to be honest with you. I don't know. Yeah, I just wanted your opinion. <laughs> yeah, so I guess if August, we still cannot safely come back to school. And then, so my opinion is we have more to worry. And then whether you can come to school or not, so that's probably your lower priority. So we have worse things to worry. If, if until August, we still cannot open school. That's my opinion. More question? Well, if there's no more questions, I just want to thank you, Shigang, for doing this. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, and I, I know there's a hard stop because the econometrics class starts in 
uh, 10 minutes. So uh, That's good, yes. yeah, so thank you so much uh, for doing this. And thank you to everybody who's here um, watching this webinar. We're going to have a um, Econ Club event um, basically every week for the next three weeks. So, um, so next week is Jobs for Economists. So yeah, there's a sign up right on the website. It's also in Econ uh, Rocks, the Canvas course. So if you want to see that, um, we'll be doing that.